Welcome back to Switzerland, Australia's business channel. I have to ask this. Did the PM get the wrong speech at the BCA shindig last night? To explain my argument, let me take you back to the first quarter break in the AFL Grand Final. By that time, the Swans trailed Hawthorne 15 to 35 and it didn't look good. Imagine if the coach, John Longmire, met the team at the break and said that they weren't travelling well and that uh, it comes at a bad time as the club has financial problems and there could be some salary cutbacks next year. He, of course, he would never do it. So why is the country's and the economy's coach always harping on how bad our finances are? Why does he allow newspapers to run with stories about penny-pinching with a few excise increase worth about $22 a year without countering it with some good news. Good news you say, yep, and I ran it uh, on Monday, but I'll repeat it. Just as the PM, the Treasurer and the Finance Minister and every other government mouthpiece should be doing as much as possible because they're in John Longmire positions. They led the country and the economy. So what's this good news? Well, Cities analyst Craig Woodford showed that the impact of falling oil prices and the fact that the government hasn't been successful in getting its tougher budget measures through means that the average Australian household will be $625 a year better off. That means a $22 fuel price increase on a tank of petrol is nothing compared to $625, even if it's embarrassing for the government because their budget is not getting through. But it will help economic growth. And it's a good news story when the economy, like the swans in the grand final, need to hear positives not negatives. The PM could talk about what Harold Mitchell told me last night, that the ad spend is on the rise and this is a good forward indicator for the economy. He also said retailers look set for a really good Christmas. He could talk about record low interest rates and how super has performed so solidly, as well as how house prices have spiked, making us all wealthier. Further, household wealth per capita has risen to a record $330,841 in the June quarter up to um, 2,860 increase over the entire quarter. I could go on, like Tony Abbott should have last night to our business leaders, about job ads pointing to more jobs in 2015, how inflation is a low 2.3%. This is what governments have been praying for for decades, with interest rates low and set to stay low, and with 180,408 new dwellings starting to be built over the 12 months to June. This is the highest annual result for dwelling starts in 19 years. I know this kind of stuff works because this is what I say at business conferences right around the country. It works a treat because people in business are naturally positive. I hope Peter Credlin, the PM's advisor, read my blog today on switzer.com.au and sets Mr Abbott's sales for a more positive destination. The irony is that if he, he and his team can get confidence up, then the economy will grow faster than expected and the deficit will fall faster than the government is predicting. And guess what? Maybe Aussies will begin to like a more positive Tony Abbott. Believe it or not, Tony Abbott is a lot like Julia Gillard. You like them more when you actually meet them. A more positive Tony Abbott? Now that's an entrepreneurial outside the square idea and it just might work for his popularity and the economy. Our stock market has nearly gone through a correction and has had a nice rebound. So what lies ahead and what stocks look like they're good value. Bill Potters, Wonderkind, Charlie Aitken, some, and some of the favourites that he likes, and they include the big miners. So let's get a, up close and personal with Charlie himself, and he joins me in the studio to find out what he exactly likes. How are you, mate? Bit hard to follow that monologue. It was very good. Oh, thanks, But mate. you're right. I mean, confidence is about leadership. It's as simple as that. Mm. The economic picture is not as dire as you'd read in the newspapers. I think you're a thousand percent right and the population needs to be led. But it also comes down to corporate Australia. Most of large cap corporate Australia continues to say, you know, we're cutting spending, we're paying higher dividends, etc., etc. That doesn't help confidence either. No. We all love our dividends, but if the, if the political leadership and the corporate leadership got their act together and actually said a few more positive things, and most of the things you point out are absolutely right there, Pete. You know, interest rates are at 20-year lows, the currency's come down, mm. oil prices have collapsed, house prices are up, unemployment's OK. You know, Western Australia's a bit slow lower after being, having a boom, but mm. you're right, the settings are there. Yeah. Christmas could be OK. Yeah. So, but to me, it's about business leadership, the listed leadership that you know, I have to mm. interact with, mm. also singing from a more positive song sheet, which is there to be sung from if they choose to. Yeah. And if they choose to. Particularly with oil, uh, oil costs coming down, that should be a good thing 
Not bad, not well, good oil for price is a regressive tax cut. Yeah. It's fantastic yeah. for the battlers more than anyone. They drive more than anyone. Uh, Unlike what the Treasurer predicted. But yeah, I know. But, uh, believe it or not, they do drive cars out there. They do. They drive big cars too. Yeah. And they, I, I read your piece today. It was very interesting. You just come back from WA. I've got a nice little dedication piece for you here as well. Let's just go to it now. Yeah. Life is a little bit quieter then than it was a few years ago, <laughs> That's but right. it's not without hope. Yeah, you know, like I mean, you go. To you know that the economy seems subdued it's because the mine boom's gone. Remember, the they had a boom that we didn't have. Obviously, the West yeah. Coast. The West Coast saved us from recession technically. The huge mining investment boom saved Australia from technical recession. Also, had the drove the currency to a, a, a level that was damaging to the country as well at a dollar ten, dollar six. Yeah. But now, when you go over there, it's all rebalancing. Obviously, the mining investment side has slowed dramatically. Commodity prices have come down. But some of the commodity prices coming down is a, res a result of Australia producing more of them, mm. which is actually a good thing. Mm. But definitely, Western Australia is slower than it, than it was, and that's not that's not new news. Mm. But I think the Reserve Bank's rebalancing of the economy that they talk about from Western Australia, from mining investment to housing and infrastructure investment on the east coast, is actually happening before your eyes, mm. as you mentioned in the data before. Mm. Those Record starts. housing starts. Mm. Infrastructure investment is on the up. Mm. But the good news is there's no inflation in the system. Mm. So these interest rate settings we see in front of us today, where banks are offering us money for less than five percent to borrow for mm. three to four years. Mm could be around for the medium term. Yeah. If that happens, then you know the consumer and business has not much excuse not to get a bit more confident. Yeah. But Perth is, Perth is not the case study for Australia. It wasn't on the way up no. and it isn't on the way down. Yeah. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting visit, but I think that you know, we need to be selective in Western Australian exposed stocks. Okay, so you got some red dirt, you, yeah, you, you camped on beaches and in tents, dongers, did you say that? I think the name is dongers, yeah. Dongers, okay. But what I found interesting about your piece today is that you talked about you like companies like BHP and Rio as a dividend play now. Well, it's interesting. After all these years on you and me on this show and others going, can we have a better percentage of the profits as dividends, please, yep. BHP, Rio, Fortescue, Woodside, etc. It's happening before our eyes. Mm. Yet the share market, because they're worried about falling commodity prices, has marked the stocks down. Mm. You know, they've all come down in PE. But if you look at the grossed up yields now, BHP has a grossed up prospective yield on consensus for this year, mm. fiscal year 15, of over 5%. Yep. It's not the same as a bank. It's not the same as Telstra. But it's a damn lot better than it used to be. Yep. Ditto Rio Tinto. Ditto Woodside. Oh, yeah, so, Woodside. Around seven percent. Yeah, and Woodside yeah, is Fortescue actually, around seven percent. Well, well. Woods, Fortescue, you've got to be careful a little yeah, bit no. because of the iron ore price. We're all having a, a guess at the iron ore price. Yeah. Woodside is a certainty. It is going to yield, you know, close to eight uh, percent growth up, yeah. and that is better than a bank. Mm. And pretty much better than Telstra. So I think some of these big, low-cost, long-life, long-duration resource stocks are now finding yield support. You saw today they all had pretty good days, actually. Yeah, yep. And the banks didn't for a day. OK. So Woodside, what percentage of its dough comes from oil and what percentage comes from gas? Because oil is... Effectively, technically, all of it comes from oil because the gas price of the LNG contracts are linked to oil. Yeah. Yet the, pro the, disc the premium they're getting to the oil price is getting larger, actually, because they're, they're trading them better, they're getting better contracts. So it's, it's hard to say it's not. It's, it's an oil and gas mix. It's really all linked to the oil price, yeah. but they're getting a higher percentage of the price than they used to, yeah. and they're producing a lot more of it, and they're paying out 80% of their uh, profits as dividends. So. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know it was Dennis Gartman. Was it he who suggested the oil price might fall to $10? Well, that's ridiculous. Yes, that's I mean, what I thought too. I mean, the, the oil price might fall to $75 or something, but the, the mistake everyone is making is looking at the oil price and saying it's a sign of terrible global growth or some problem in China or Germany slowing down. It's not. It's about supply hitting. It's about the US shale grass revolution, the supply response out of Australia. It's also about Saudi Arabia just keep on pumping. Mm -hmm. But it's about, you know, pipelines being reversed in America. We've talked on the show last month about the oil price. Mm -hmm. It is actually a structural change about supply arriving and also the strong US dollar and the oil price is a price in US dollars. I think that the, the possibly the most positive thing, like uh, Craig Wolford from Citigroup said, who's an excellent analyst, by the way, this is a big event, you know, for retailers, for households, for, for just about everyone. The oil, the oil price is falling and staying down. It's going to be, like, like, a going to be like a multiplier effect. It's going to be like a multiplier effect, isn't it? Because there'll be an autonomous increase in consumption. Great. Yeah. And so well, assuming people consume it, but like you said in your monologue, we need confidence. Mm. Confidence comes from leadership. Every time you're told there's a budget deficit or how bad the economy is, it doesn't help. Mm. It's as simple as that. Yeah. You know, it just makes people, instead of the 600 bucks they're getting from the oil price that they're saving in a household, 
that they may not they may they may save it not spend it yeah if they're confident they'll spend it exactly. and then we get the multiplier through the economy which we all need exactly right now while we're on the the miners a couple of our viewers said Charlie mentioned BC Iron yes it's been a disaster I, it's been a disaster but it's lower price is there something structurally wrong? Obviously, you have studied the, the, the company yeah. because it's let you down in, in a sense. But is there something wrong, or is, is it a really good buy at this level? Look, I think at a dollar twenty, or wherever they are today, I think uh, it, it's it's much better value when I first recommended it. But I mean, what happened was they've downgraded their production, and also the iron ore price has fallen sharply. Yeah. At these prices, they're probably making a small loss, probably not a marginally positive. Mm. It take, depends on your view on iron ore. If you think iron ore can recover a bit, I do think iron ore can recover a bit. I think the Australian dollar can go lower mm. than the stocks are tremendous by. Mm. But look, it's one of those situations where it fell dramatically through any price level I thought was rational, mm. and therefore you have to reassess it. But on the, on the analysis, I would say that it's oversold. I would say it would bounce back, yeah. but it's fallen much further. It takes courage to buy in yeah, gloom, but, look, but it's often when you make money, look, isn't it? You know, no one wanted to buy Qantas at a dollar and then now a dollar sixty. That's right. You know, like and, no and, one wanted and, to buy and Telstra. And you cop a clobbering then, like, you, but the people who stuck with it. To be honest, I deserve a bit of a clobbering for BCI. And that's gone yeah. much further than I thought it would. Yeah. Qantas, no one really notices. It sneaks up sixty percent, but a dollar when the headlines were so negative on Qantas less than, you know, six months ago. Yeah. No one wanted to touch it, but then suddenly they just start climbing the wall of worry, as we yeah. say. And also, I think people have to understand there are some stocks you play for trading. Yeah. So if you bought in quantities of the dollar yeah. and a dollar sixty, you probably take that profit Correct. and we say you little bit. I mean, it's like BCI and without dwelling on the negatives too much. I mean, they should never be more than say one percent of your portfolio. They're small stocks. The main game in town is large miners, oil stocks, Woolworths, Wes Farmers, Telstra, and the banks mm. and the insurance stocks. Yeah. That's the big part of the market. And you, and you surprised me a couple of weeks ago in one of your notes because you were anti banks until the correction or near correction yeah. and I think you then went back for ANZ or NAB or one of those. Yeah, no, it was, it, you had price, to be quick like yeah. I mean it, being anti-banks is one thing when they fall 10 to 15 yeah. percent you have to adjust your strategy. Yeah. I mean that, that, I did that on Telstra, I did that on the AMP, I did that on numerous large cap stocks mm. when the market was around 5100. It's it's about price beat. You can yeah. if you predict a correction that happens you've got to react to it. Yeah. The, the, the worst, I think I wrote in one of your letters that uh, the last thing you want to do when the market corrects is get more bearish. Yeah. You've got to switch it around and that's what I tried to do. I tried to do as much as I could, but you can never do it as, as quickly as you as you'd like. No, of or as wide as I, but I think we got the message through that the 5100 was the bottom of the trading range. It has proved the bottom of the trading range in the ASX 200, and the market's bounced back to wherever we are today, 54, 50 odd. I was intrigued that you 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 sort of um, into uh, Kerry Stokes' Nowhere Man is the name of the book, isn't it? Man, the boy from nowhere. The boy from nowhere, and and as a consequence, you like Seven Holdings Group. Well, I think Seven. It, the book I'd have to recommend to your readers. The book is an excellent business book. I'm going to get Andrew Rule on the yeah, program. Uh, it is an excellent read. It's easy to read. It's a bit of a yarn. It's a bit of a story. But there's some great lessons in business in it about buying low, using a bit of leverage when it He's matters, selling. pretty good at business, Kerry Stokes. I'll tell you, I found it a very educational book. Yeah. And I think it gets released on the East Coast tomorrow. Yeah, but it it, it, it's excellent. But what it said to me, I mean, you look at Stokes at the moment, you look at Seven Group, they're currently buying their own shares back on market mm. at what I would say is NTA, nine times earnings and a grossed up dividend yield of 8%. Mm. And when when you read the book and work backwards, you go, that's exactly how Kerry Stokes has made money, buying low, mm. you know, being a diversified, being an asset trader. Mm. And I think the book is excellent reading, but it's another reason I think, look, I think Seven Group requires a bit of contrarian uh, guts to buy. Yeah. It's a bit out of favour. It's got the Caterpillar franchise, obviously. Cater which reported well, which yeah, I think but, is a good thing. you had to break it down a bit, unfortunately. Okay. You know, a lot of the Caterpillar in America growth was out of North America in construction construction equipment. The, the Asian mining sales were down. That's really okay. what, what Seven Group do. But yeah. look, that's well known to the market. The shares are doing a little bit better. I think they're supported by yield. But after reading the book, I've got actually... I think I understand Kerry Stokes a bit more when you go through the whole process of how he got to being where he is. Yep. And I'd encourage everyone to read it. I think it's an excellent book just for educating yourself on business. And you think Seven Holding Group is a contrarian buy? Contrarian buy. If nothing else, we get paid a 5% fully frank dividend around here. That's fine. It's probably the bottom of the cycle in most of the things it does. Mm. You might have to be a little bit patient, but you're co-investing with a guy who's proven to be extremely successful and he owns 70% of the shares himself. And you're buying at a good price rather than a high Correct. price. Correct. The idea is to buy low. As we got. It takes guts to buy low. Mm. Buying high is the easiest thing on earth, Pete. Mm. You feel good, you feel you're in company, but it's not how you make money you've got to you've got to wait for the knife to stick in the you know the value floor that's what happened in banks the other day that's what happened in insurance the other that's what happened in the market the other day 
and you've got to be quick and you've got to have the, the tenacity to pick it up. Okay, Charlie. Thanks for joining us on the show. And of course, Charlie writes for the Switzer Super Report and we hang on every word he says. Oh. Not always right. No, but he's well, usually none of us are always right. Hey, even I make mistakes at times. I'll tell you what, your monologue today was excellent, Pete, and you're right. Cheers, buddy. After the break, stock markets have turned positive, but can they stay that way? Marcel von Pfeiffer on this subject next. <laughs> 